keep the introduction very brief, and I want to, because I want to hear what this wonderful woman has to say about her perception of liberty. One of the things I think that is happening within the greater liberty movement is that we are starting to build bridges across separate things where people are coming from different parts and they're saying, we know something's not right and let's start to figure out the solutions. I have been reading Naomi Wolf's books since I was in college, not to, oh, I can date myself because you all know how old I am. But I've been reading her for a long time. It's always found like a sweet little space in my heart I was excited when she said she would come here. I had heard an interview that she did with Lou Rockwell a few years ago, and it was one of those moments where you could hear in the podcast that her mind was changing, his mind was changing, because there was a real true dialogue going on. So I'm deeply honored and very excited to invite Naomi Wolf to the stage at Liberty Forum 2014. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carla, for this incredible gathering. And um, I'm feeling so many feelings uh, standing here. Uh, first, can you all hear me without? Yeah. Wonderful. I. I first want to just disclose that I feel incredibly starstruck to be here because as I've been saying throughout the evening, you know, I travel all over the country and now throughout the world talking about these issues and, the, and people are in despair, we know that, but the only community I've seen or witnessed yet that is actually getting off their asses and doing something is this Liberty community right here, right here. So I, I so, I'm so, so honored to be here. I, but I also, I, I need to be able to see the time because I have a lot to say and I don't want to run out. But well, I, well, I, I mean, I could give you a clock. Me a, if you give me a clock, then I can just pace myself. Um, but I also just want to disclose that I'm, I'm, I'm going to start out, this is like a big night for me. It's very emotional for a lot of reasons. Ever since I wrote the book, The End of America, in 2008, which was about the initial subversion of, of liberties in this country, the, the establishment of the police state under Bush, um, many, many people from across the political spectrum have been asking me to update this argument for the Obama era. And, you know, as we all know, it's gotten so much worse since 2008. Many of you are familiar with the end of America, so I'm just going to touch briefly on what it has to say. It's basically an argument that says that every dictator, whether he or she is on the left or on the right, always uses 10 steps, takes 10 concrete actions in order to crush a democracy or, or close down a democracy movement, and that we were seeing those 10 steps in the United States beginning uh, by 2008. Um, but it's been kind of, you know, I've kind of been like this for the last five years because actually telling the story of how much more serious it's become is so heartbreaking. That said, um, I'm in the one place where, I mean, you know, the revolution in this country began with a handful of people exactly like you. So I absolutely cannot despair, and, and I just want to tell you that you know for five years I've been saying, no, I'm not going to do it, I can't face it, it's too awful. But when I was asked by the Liberty Forum to speak, I thought it was just so important that I had to, this is the first time I'm giving this speech, and it's to you because of the great love that I have for you and what you're doing. So here we are. So, I wrote The End of America initially because I um, am the daughter of Holocaust survivors and I became weirdly uh, aware in, by 2008 that there were echoes that I could hear in what was going on historically around us. And I would see the Patriot Act or the establishment of Guantanamo 
and I would hear this echo, they did this in Germany, they did this in Germany. And I would sort of check in with other adult children of Holocaust survivors and they would confirm, yes, that that's true, that's an exact parallel from Germany. And at that time, it was really only Holocaust survivors, children or Holocaust survivors who were saying, whoa, you know, this is familiar, this doesn't go anywhere good. Um, it was a very marginal thing to talk about in, in 2008. Uh, but I, I was intrigued and worried, and so I looked at some history. I looked at other times and places where a would-be dictator, again, whether on the left or on the right, because it doesn't matter, uh -huh. right? <laughs> they all do the same awful things. Um, when, when such a person wanted to close down a democracy, I, you know, I wanted to see what happened. And so I looked at Mussolini's Italy in the 1920s. Uh, Hitler learned from Mussolini. I looked at Hitler's Germany. I looked at East Germany in the 50s, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia in the 60s, um, in the 70s in Chile under Pinochet, China in the 1980s. And what I saw was this clear blueprint, that there was a blueprint for closing down an open society and that it took these 10 steps. Um, and so what I'm going to do tonight is that I'm going to sort of swiftly, because unfortunately there's so much to update this argument with, you know, recapitulate each of these 10 steps and then tell you what's happened since then. Uh, and then I'm going to end with what we need to do now, but I just want to kind of get this out of the way because I'm feeling so emotional about it and I need to kind of speak to you. Um, before I stood up here tonight, I had a conversation with Jessica Raddick, who represents a very, br we have very brave heroes in this audience. I mean, any number of heroes, many of you I don't know, because heroism can happen in all kinds of places, whether you're in the news or not in the news, everything you're doing is heroic, especially at this point in history. Um, but we know about Thomas Drake and Jessica Raddick and the courage they've shown in speaking up as whistleblowers. And Jessica Raddick is a, an attorney and she was detained at Heathrow recently um, for representing Edward Snowden. And I'm getting quite teary about this because it's like a new, when they go after, like, it's a new, very, very dark development. Um, so I just want to honor Thomas Drake and Jessica Raddick sitting here with us in this audience. It, it takes great, great courage. Um, and, and now I need to, now that I've kind of disclosed this and how sort of heartbroken it makes me feel, I'm gonna switch now to walk us through this dark valley because at, on the other side of it is, has to be a roadmap to more heroism, more victory and more fighting back because if our forefathers and mothers didn't believe that, when they were battling as a handful of, you know, scruffy, marginalized, you know, farmers and homemakers against the biggest power on earth at that time, which was Great Britain, we would not have the country that we love so much, that's now under so much threat. So I'm gonna power through and then we'll get to the, the hope on the other side. Um, but bear with me, it's, it's just bear with me because it's like this and then it's like that. All right. Um, so the first step a would-be dictator always takes is to invoke a terrifying internal and external threat. And often it's a real threat that is then hyped for purposes of closing down a democracy. Um, Kristallnacht, many of you are familiar with, it was a terrorist action in Germany that many people think was staged. Uh, but the reaction after Kristallnacht was that um, Hitler's administration, which had come to power completely legally, everything his, that Hitler did was completely through the law, through the passage of law, which we're seeing now, um, was a set of, of laws weirdly, chillingly foreshadowing the Patriot Act. Um, laws that allowed the government to read your telegrams, listen in on your phone conversations, um, and, and strip citizens of various rights. Um, 
terrorist, a terrorist threat that was hyped allowed Pinochet, for instance, to seize power. You see this again and again. And I made the case in End of America that yes, 9-11 happened. I live 10 blocks away from ground zero. But that many, many societies like Spain and until recently Britain have had real terrorist attacks but haven't reacted by closing down their own democracies. They've actually reacted by strengthening their democracies in the case of Spain. Um, and that that has been used as a kind of theater to uh, suppress civil liberties. Um, at the end of this talk, I'm going to tell you who I think is behind this, uh, because my understanding of this has evolved since 2008. Um, but we'll get to that. So of course, in the wake of 9-11, you know, this ushered in the Patriot Act, which laid the foundation for all of the suppressions of civil liberties that we saw subsequently. The second step would-be dictators always take is to establish secret prisons outside the rule of law. Um, you know, you see this, of course, with the basement uh, detention centers that the uh, brown shirts started in the, in the 30s. You saw it under Stalin with Siberia, gulags, uh, concentration camps, detention camps. Now, the sort of chilling effect of a, a detention center outside the rule of law is why our brilliant founders and their beautiful constitution calls for due process and speedy trials, right? It's not an abstraction. These men and women who founded our country knew they'd come from, they'd fled societies where the king could just lock you up on his own say-so, right, with no recourse. And that's why John Adams risked great hostility in his own day by insisting on representing the people who were seen as the terrorists of that day, which was the British militia who, who had been um, arrested. Uh, people said, no, they don't deserve representation. But John Adams knew, the founders knew, you know, what it meant to not have that right to a trial of your peers. Um, in 2008, I, I spoke about Guantanamo having been established. And then in 2009, I actually traveled there. It was a completely life-changing journey. Um, I mean, like, you can smell evil. I now know that. You know, I, I've been in the presence of it. I mean, I was in, oh my god, I was, you know, in that medical facility where they were strapping people down and force feeding them when they were on hunger strikes, and it was medical doctors who'd kind of gone over to the dark side to participate in torturing these people. And when I was there, an inmate, a detainee actually died um, in the process of being fed. Uh, and I remember interviewing these doctors and nurses, and there were doctors and nurses, remember, in Auschwitz, right? In Bergen-Belsen. And I could feel and smell, I've never forgotten it, the, like the, this almost demonic presence. It was different from ordinary human badness or ignorance or harmfulness. It was like the presence of evil. Um, well, Guantanamo, you know, was one of the first things Obama promised to close as his first executive order, but in 2009, six months after his election, when I visited it, uh, I, I witnessed millions of dollars in new construction. They were building it up and building it up. Today, 172 men uh, are still languishing behind, behind bars without charge of trial in Guantanamo. You know, I've never said this in public before. Um, when I was in Guantanamo, and they've stopped letting journalists go there, you may have noticed, I saw a room, this was like before they realized what you know, it was a new administration. They didn't realize they shouldn't let people like me, you know, <laughs> take a look. Um, but there was, there's a place called Camp X-Ray where they house detainees before they built these giant new facilities. And it's like cages in the desert, cages open to the environment, like 12 by 12 cages covered with rats, some sort of species of rats scurrying around that are this big. Nothing, nothing there, an open cage, right, and a, a urinal. And there was like this shed that I walked into 
and it was for interrogations. And there was a pile of chairs in the middle of the shed. And on every chair, I could see the marks at where the ankles would be and where the wrists would be of duct tape. And in the center of the ceiling, descending from the ceiling, was a hook. And attached to the hook was a wasp's nest. So when I went there, I confirmed that the state-of-the-art electronic equipment that could bring any witness into the tribunal's courtroom to say, for instance, as witnesses are there to say if they've got the wrong guy, if there's evidence that he was here instead of there when they're saying he was there, um, it was the state-of-the-art electronic equipment to bring by audio and video any witness, and Guantanamo spokespeople were saying, of course, we bring witnesses whenever reasonable into the tribunals. And if you flirt with a contractor, they will tell you anything. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I was very, very, very charming to several of the contractors there. And by the way, it's clear that Guantanamo is run by contractors rather than military. The military are subordinated to the contractors. And he confirmed for me that, in fact, that state-of-the-art equipment in seven years had never been used once. Not once. So what I always ask audiences when I talk about what happens when a state establishes a gulag outside the rule of law is I ask them, and I, I offer a reward, which is easy for me to do because I know no one will claim it. So it can be as big as you want, a million dollars. Who can name for me a society that established a gulag or a detention area outside the rule of law where torture can take place, or the equivalent of torture, that, that wasn't eventually used against that society's own citizens? You can't name it because it doesn't exist. What happens with this step is that a leader or an oligarchy will establish this detention center outside the rule of law, and we'll then, and, and we'll start with the most marginalized people, the terrorists, these scary Muslims, these brown people with names you can't pronounce who, who hate our freedoms, right? Or the Jews in Germany, or the gypsies, or the homosexuals, the most marginalized people. And everyone's like, okay, it's just the Jews. Okay, it's just those homosexuals. We don't need them. All right, it's the gypsies. They're a little unusual. You know, whatever it is, they're, they're not us. They're not us. And then what happens is it comes closer and closer and closer. And then they start to get always the same cast of characters. The editors, the journalists, the opposition leaders, the outspoken <laughs> clergy, union leaders. And once that happens, and it happened in 1933 in Germany, in Germany, it takes three to six months to close down an open society because everybody's scared to speak. And that is unexceptionable. You cannot, you cannot tell me where that hasn't happened. So as I predicted, sooner or later, torture would come home if we didn't close Guantanamo. And I have to say, why do I love you guys so much? Because I've been saying this for, what is it, five years, six years, and everybody agrees with me, right? I mean, nobody has said in the audiences that I speak to, yes, Guantanamo is a good idea. But, <laughs> but actually taking action to, to, to do something, to close it, to change the law, to protect everybody so that they don't come for us and our children, you are the only ones I know who have actually done that. And six people at the ACLU and the Center for Constitutional Rights. So God bless you. Um, as I predicted, and each time one of these things happens, I think this can't be happening. This can't be happening. And I you know, you go through it over and over and over. So in 2011, I remember it was New Year's Eve. And I was like frantically Facebooking my community to get them to know about the National Defense Authorization Act and get them to take action. What is the National Defense Authorization Act? It is the most terrifying law in the world, in the United States, that has ever been introduced, let alone passed. And Clause 21 gives the President of the United States, as I predicted they would, god damn it, <laughs> If you could roll back the clock and actually get the revolution when you need the revolution instead of when it's like you, you see the running over the cliff, you know, you see it year after year. It's like, it's a cliff, it's a cliff. 
And here's the cliff, and the cliff is the NDAA. Gives the President of the United States the power to arrest and detain any of you here, me, without charge or trial forever. Some of you know about it, some of you don't, and you're the most informed community in the United States about these issues. Why do you not know about it? Because not a single major media outlet, a paragraph in the New York Times, treated this like the biggest story in American history for the last 400 years. In fact, I remember being, I was at the hearing for the National Defense Authorization Act, and I was taking notes on a napkin, and that was the reporting that emerged from that hearing because there was no media there from major news outlets except The Guardian, and no transcript. And I actually sat there while lawyers for the President of the United States argued that yes, or they confirmed to an incredulous judge that yes, in fact, the law would allow them to detain journalist Chris Hedges forever if they wanted to, or activists from Occupy. Yes, they agreed that was the case. Is this news? Does this deserve to be news? Well, mysteriously, it has been entirely not reported. Um, in 2011-2012, the U.S. took the secret prison straight to Americans, outing a kill list that included U.S. citizens. Anwar al-Awlaki was the first American openly assassinated by his government without charge of trial. His teenage son, who was 16 years old, was killed as well. So what has happened, and you'll see this in example after example, is that the kind of crude mechanisms of 2008, like let's build Guantanamo or let's you know, have Blackwater, they're not that effective in a vibrant democracy. So what's happened is that the, the coup has kind of been institutionalized and made invisible through more sophisticated mechanisms. And it's happening around the world. Um, so now, you know, we have these drone strikes. Right now, they're just in Yemen or just in, you know, Jeremy Scahill reports like 23 undocumented on illegal wars around the world that the U.S. is waging. Well, the drone strikes just take out whoever they want to take out. But since these are illegal wars, why do we think? You know, drones were made uh, legal to fly in U.S. airspace in 2013. Why do we think the war will not come home? So Guantanamo, in effect, has been exported and is ready to come home. It, it exists theoretically with the National Defense Authorization Act in the United States. The third step is to develop a paramilitary force, a uh, thug caste. Why is this? Well, the founders knew how easy it was to crush a free people when you had militia who were not answerable to the people, uh, like the, the um, mercenaries who were you know, working for George III, who could break into houses, abuse women, and terrify children. And that's why the Constitution calls for a well-ordered militia, and why we had a law called Posse Comitatus, which ensured that the National Guard, who are answerable to the people, police us domestically, never the military. When the military police a society, that is a police state. That's not a democracy anymore. You understand the distinction, right? All right. Well, dictators always create and use thugs, brown shirts, in Germany, black shirts in Italy, who beat up the key sectors. I mentioned editors, journalists, outspoken clergy, et cetera. Um, and again, that's why we have the Second Amendment, too. And I've kind of moved in my position on this. I used to be, you know, I'm a Jewish girl from New York, surrounded by liberals. I'm honored that you are welcoming me here, because I know I don't share the exact same demographic as every single one of you. And when you grow up in my demographic, you just assume that anyone who likes, hi there, Jewess friend. <laughs> um, but you just, you just are raised to believe that anyone who believes in um, gun rights is a lunatic, right? This is like we all have our, it, our, New York is like that. Yeah, we all have our cultural baggage or preconceptions. Um, and I, I've really, you know, moved on this because now I, I still hate gun violence, of course, but our government is at war with us, and now they're killing us. And the founders wrote the Second Amendment because they too 
were facing a government that was at war with them and killing them. And that's where we are. That's the truth of where we are. And I believe that this you know, insistent assault we're seeing right now on taking away gun rights, or restricting gun rights, I hate guns. I wish they didn't exist. I wish we didn't need them in the United States. But when the government is at war with you, I do think the founders' wisdom that citizens have to be able to defend themselves is profound. I can't believe I just said that in public. <laughs> got my back. I, I'm so glad because uh, I'll need your help. <laughs> um, so in 2008, I spoke about Blackwater. Most of you are familiar with Blackwater. It's basically a mercenary force, um, which was set up to operate outside the rule of law in Iraq. In 2008, it had built headquarters in San Diego, California, South Carolina, and Illinois. It's now, but this was like, it got bad press. I mean, this is what I mean about things being kind of clumsy and obvious that are now like much more sophisticated and behind the scenes. So uh, it's now changed its name to Academy and operates all over the world, suppressing peaceful civic dissent in, in um, places like Bahrain, which is an ally of ours where we're supposed to be supporting democracy. But you know, with all these trends, as I said, the thugs are now harder to identify and have been merged and normalized into everyday life, into invisibility. The Department of Homeland Security has um, sort of systematically militarized and privatized domestic police forces throughout the country. Uh, many of you are aware of this. Um, so millions of dollars in tanks and, you know, heavy armaments and the kind of equipment you use in a war, weirdly, are being transferred from DHS to little police stations in little towns all over America, you know. <laughs> In New Hampshire, good God, Concord, New Hampshire. Say that again. You fought it, but you lost. Wow. Yeah, no, I'm I'm proud of you for fighting it. I'm proud of you for fighting it. Well, it's it's happening all over the country. Actually, you guys are scaring me even more when I'm talking that I was scared already. But this is this is real. Um, all over the country, this has happened, and uh, in my own hometown, there's these giant sections of Lower Manhattan that I did some investigative reporting, I found that they've all been kind of taken over by DHS jurisdiction. So they're basically like not New York anymore. They kind of belong to the DHS. And the DHS is hiring 40,000 police or have hired 40,000 police to manage these militarized sectors of downtown New York. And they're expanding into Midtown. And when you go down there, it's really clear, like there are vans, these white vans with blacked out windows, you know, all over the place that say Department of Homeland Security, there's no secrecy about it. Um, and this is happening all over the country. So why is this so important? You know, police forces in a civilian society that's at peace, which used to be America, are answerable to the mayor, and the mayor is answerable to the people, and you can vote them out, or you can investigate them, or you can fire the police commissioner. But when you have an entity like DHS doing top-down militarized policing, it's the same as, or it's a, a, a shortcut around the unpopular and obvious technique of actually sending the military. Do you understand the distinction? OK. Um, so in. 2011, there was this incredible uprising of people who might not share your policy prescriptions, but who share your love of freedom, and that's the Occupy movement. Yeah. Now, I'm not a member of the Occupy movement, but I got arrested along with my partner in 2011 for standing on a sidewalk outside an event to which we'd been invited and informing the protesters of what their First Amendment rights were under the law. That was my crime. Thank you. And I have to tell you, in a time when people are being rendered to mysterious places and never heard from again, you know, 
they handcuffed us and they put us in the back of a van. And all of the, you know, National Lawyers Guild witnesses and the protesters were running to the third precinct, which was the precinct that was the jurisdiction where we were arrested. But when we were in the van, they, they swerved and they took us somewhere else. And it was clear that they were taking us somewhere else and somewhere that we didn't know. We didn't know where we were going. And the intention was to avoid the lawyers and to avoid the witnesses and to take us somewhere unaccountable. And, uh, you know, I know I'm sort of still in America, but I cannot tell you what it feels like to be handcuffed in a van in America in 2011 and know that you're going somewhere that no one knows where you're going to be. Um, so there was this uprising with a very interesting agenda to like critique the abuses of the banks, the uh, income inequity that is so prevalent now in the United States, and other kinds of completely First Amendment protected activities and intentions. This is the Occupy movement. Um, but there was a coordinated crackdown in the fall against all of these uh, settlements or camps in various cities across the country. Um, and it was very violent. People in Oakland suffered head injuries. People in LA were handcuffed so tightly they had circulation damage and they were left in their feces and urine for hours, which is a real like Guantanamo Abu Ghraib tactic. Um, reporters were threatened, their cameras were confiscated. Uh, so this was a, a massive, massive crackdown. And what came to light later is that the Department of Homeland Security had been on a call with the mayors of all of these cities coordinating this crackdown. So something's happening at a level higher than or unaccountable to the way America does business with checks and balances, which is, you know, mayors make the decision accountable to the electorate. Um, and, and this mass coordination of, of a military response to First Amendment protected freedom of assembly. Um, so what's happened now is that New York City police and San Francisco police and probably other cities are now increasingly privatized. You probably don't know about this. They're being hired by big banks for more than their civic pay. Um, you can see them in, in New York. You go into TD Bank or Chase and there's a New York City police officer and you're like, why are you inside the bank? And then they'll tell you about this program where the banks hire the police officers. So what I'm asking you to imagine is a situation where Occupy is protesting the banks and the police are there to maintain order and to protect the citizens of New York. But if, if the bank has the police, right, who, who will watch the watchers? This is the theme of the conference. Who will watch the watchers? Our police have now been hired away from us by this oligarchy, quietly. Um, now, not only was there this violent crackdown against Occupy, but laws were passed after it to criminalize protests near a government official with 15-year sentences. And in the wake of this violent crackdown and these new laws, Occupy has really not reassembled uh, with any impact at all. And I, I will say that there have been no major protests in America since that crackdown. And now, I mean, this is so heartbreaking, but now when I, I used to be like out there talking to citizens and, and at the end of it I'd be like, okay, let's, let's, you know, start a movement. Who will start the email list? Who will host the meetings? And there used to be citizens to do that before 2011 in this crackdown. And now there's silence. Not because people don't want to do it, but because they know that the risks are too high and now with the surveillance that has been introduced, they know that there's no such thing as private First Amendment protected activity, dissent, freedom of assembly. So it worked, it was effective. The fourth Big step is to surveil ordinary citizens. The Stasi, for instance, in East Germany, only had files on 10% of the population. But that's all it took, because everyone in East Germany believed that they were being surveilled. Um, the KGB was a secret police system spying on citizens, and so on and so on. Do I need to give you guys a moment to process this before I go on? It's very big, I'm sorry. Are you all right? You're here, you're very brave. <laughs> 
this is what it's like to be a libertarian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. It's going to be dark and then it's going to be light. That's right. Um, so this is why our brilliant, brilliant founders, they weren't perfect, but what they had a glimpse of was perfect. I mean, it wasn't perfectly realized, but that shining kernel, that, that golden key at the heart of the Constitution, I mean, I really do believe that that kind of, it's like a platonic ideal. It descends from another realm of justice and illumination. And, you know, all over the world, people want that. They emulate that. They crave it, right? And, of course, it had to be made better and made better with rights for African Americans and rights for women and so on. But the, that glimmer was perfect. So one, of, one aspect of, can I walk among you? Is that okay? Or is that all right? Oh, is it okay if I, all right. So is it okay if, can you all see me if I do this? I just, I feel like I need to be among my people and not so far away. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, the brilliant founders created the Fourth Amendment. And I just think it's important, you know, in these times to kind of almost meditate from time to time on the beauty of each of these amendments and really inscribe them on our hearts and our children's hearts as they're being erased in the culture. And, you know, just look at them from time to time. The Fourth Amendment, it's so beautiful. I mean, my, my favorite, I confess, are the first and the fourth. Um, but uh, that precious amendment says that you need to persuade a magistrate that you have a probable cause to confiscate my papers, come into my home, and search my computer, right? Privacy, privacy, what is that? You know, we're, we're, we're so bombarded with propaganda that it doesn't matter and it's all out there anyway and if you're not doing anything wrong why should you be worried but privacy isn't just about not doing anything wrong it's the freedom to do whatever you want <laughs> and i want to say something else about privacy which is that these assaults are happening on a, on a state level and on a kind of external level, but just as important to me, which is why I say our only hope right now is to kind of grow this from within and transform ourselves from within and reach out to each other and also then have strategy and organization and lawyers and witnesses and so on, um, is that what happens in a closed society is people's sense of their right to be free gets undermined and then they forget right they forget to want to be free and that's the real victory like you can lock up a million people and if they haven't forgotten to want to be free you can't keep them down forever but if you break that wanting you know you can take away all the laws that suppress them they'll still be like robots or automatons right so why do i say that because privacy is where we let ourselves have freedom to wander inside our own minds and inside our own relationships and find out who we are, right? And just, you know, even if we're not doing anything wrong, just knowing that we're being surveilled creates an element of self-consciousness that keeps us from polishing that part of our souls that doesn't know where it's gonna go, right? That's open, that's questioning, that's self-respecting. So, I mean, that's why, like, it's so interesting when you look at, like, penal servitude or, or ways that different societies break prisoners, often there's nudity involved. Like, they stripped the prisoners in Abu Ghraib, they stripped the prisoners at Auschwitz. You know, what is that about? It's stripping people of their dignity, stripping them of their right to have some self-protection, some, some privacy, some dignity. Um, and it's a way of enforcing that kind of slave mentality. So, uh, I think that the bombardment of, of, of information we're getting right now that we're all under surveillance is as much about constructing a slave mentality as it is about actually finding out what's in our computers. Um, but, so I wrote it, you know, in 2008 about this very crude early DH effort to surveil people who still had a Fourth Amendment, such as the no-fly list. And by the way, I don't keep I mean to keep talking about myself, but I've realized in speaking to you that I have been having all kinds of brushes with these things, as many of you have as well. Um, in, in the Bush era, every time I traveled, I would get on, 
on an airline, I would get four S's and Jessica's <laughs> nodding. Yes, we are the dangerous, dangerous threats to society, you and me and our blowouts, <laughs> you know, um, right? Um, the, the, the four S's on our uh, boarding pass, which is like triple extra bad security threat, you know? <laughs> and, um, and, you know, weirdly enough, when Obama was elected, my four S's disappeared, uh, but, uh, but then Jessica got in trouble, so it, it's just a shifting. Your, your S's disappeared with, with, when Obama was elected. Right, right. But I guess they have other techniques now that they... Oh, now, I'm on a now you're on a different list. Oh, my God. <laughs> Too many lists. So, um, so I warned that the reason surveillance was so effective... I'm sorry, the no-fly list was used as... A, which used terror as a vector to intimidate and spy on the whereabouts of citizens who were criticizing the state um, or defending critics of the state. I warned that the reason surveillance was so effective is that those who have seized power surveil Congress people and leaders and blackmail them. This is an absolutely standard thing that happens, and I predicted that that would happen. And when I, when I say I predicted, I predicted I'm not trying to blow my own horn. It, do, it does, doesn't take a rocket scientist. If you study history, you know that if they introduce surveillance there, that's where it's going to go. If they introduce torture there, that's where it's going to go. There's no mystery to it. So now, Edward Snowden, whom Jessica is representing, another round of applause. <laughs> has revealed that the government is capturing every keystroke on our computers. And I fear that this is the new normal globally uh, and that we're being asked to get used to it. Um, there's a new campaign biography of Hillary Clinton, which touts the way that Hillary Clinton merged telecommunications entities and internet companies and government efforts um, and noticed that you could use this merger to destabilize governments. The example was Iran. Um, and there's a chilling sentence that describes her understanding that the power of this alliance uh, could be used domestically. All right. So we've seen a rash of news stories recently about powerful people being brought down by surveillance from anti-Wall Street corruption crusader Elliot Spitzer to Hillary Clinton's own top aide, Huma Abedin's husband, Anthony Weiner. And you know the, the press kind of directs our attention to the, the tacky sex aspect of these scandals, but that's the wrong place to look. Where you really should be noticing is that these people are under surveillance and that they're being turned into exemplars of what can happen to anyone if they get on the wrong side of the powers that be. Um, so missteps and peccadilloes that would have been private now become fodder for tabloids and punishment for those who may challenge power since everybody has secrets. I just want to take a moment to say, let's honor secrets. Everybody has secrets. I don't mean we're all criminals and, you know, forging currency. I mean that we're human beings and we have secrets. Everybody has things that they don't necessarily want on the front page of the New York Times or in the hands of the NSA, right? Human beings, 50% of people commit adultery. I'm not saying it's a great thing to do. I don't think it's a happy thing to inflict or live through, but we're human beings. We have secrets. We talk to our therapists. We have drug addictions, alcohol addictions. We talk to our accountants about things that may be near the line. You know, we have bipolar disorders. We get help for our problems. We have all kinds of things that are secrets, that in a free, open society, adults are entitled to keep secrets. And we've been brainwashed by this fucking terror hype to think that we're not allowed to have secrets because the, the notion that we might have a private life with some privacy, including secrets, is being constantly represented as a threat to the state. Well, guess what? You know, the human condition involves having secrets that you might not want to you know, share with everyone in the world. You might not want to share with the NSA. And that is one of the things that the Fourth Amendment is supposed to protect. <laughs> Thank you. But in the Snowden revelations hearings between Congress and James Clapper, who is speaking for the NSA, a congressperson directly asked him if the NSA was spying on Congress. And he did not get a denial. 
scandals in the news recently direct attention at the adultery of General Petraeus or the fact that the Secret Service was apparently consorting with prostitutes while in Latin America. I mean, that's one of those things that it's not gentlemanly, I don't want to be that guy's wife, but it's not, you know, whatever, it's his problem, it's their problem. It, it is nobody's business, right, but theirs. Um, but to a watcher like me, the subtext of these stories is, unless it's a national security issue, of course, but in this case it wasn't, you can be the, the top general, in, I'm going to say that again, to a watcher like me, the subtext of these stories is, you can be the top general in the United States of America and we can bring you down. You can be guarding the President of the United States of America and we can bring you down. Do you understand what it means that the NSA is spying on the Secret Service and blackmailing them? Do you get that? It, this is especially chilling because the security of the president depends on the Secret Service being loyal first to their job and the president and not subject to blackmail. Do you see what happens when someone can blackmail Congress and General Petraeus and the security detail of the president? It, yeah. If Congress and the top military and the president's security detail are victims of unconstitutional surveillance, it means in effect that there is a power hiding in plain sight, the NSA, that is now more powerful than the heads of our existing institutions and chains of command. And this is called a coup. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Fifth step is to infiltrate citizens' groups, and I don't need to spend time on that. You all know about it. Probably, statistically, 20% of you here. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for paying for full tickets. That's right. Our tax dollars at work, right? Um, I mean, I have to say, it's so weird these days when I go to speak to like an Occupy event or an anti-NSA rally because you, you can spot them, you know, and they're so weird looking, these infiltrators. Um, it, you, they're so obvious. It's like, it's, like, it's like Central Command somewhere in Washington got stuck in 1973 in their idea of what a dissident looks like. And so you'll see like a really overweight, middle-aged white guy on a skateboard with, seriously, with, and they're all wearing, all these people are wearing white people dreadlocks with a headband, right? So you can put on the headband and there are your dreadlocks and then you take off your headband and your dreadlocks to sit at your keyboard, you know, back in your office. Um, and there's like this fat white guy on a skateboard with, you know, dreadlocks. And it's like, if you're skateboarding every day, you're not going to look like that. You know? um, but I'm sorry, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be critical of any one body shape. It's just, uh, it was just, uh, you know, it's these anomalies. Or maybe a better example is, I keep seeing these women entwining themselves around various, uh, or trying to entwine themselves around various leaders of, of opposition groups, and they're wearing the white people dreadlocks and the headband, and tie-dyed t-shirts, which, when did that, right? Like, when, 67, 60, I was five years old when that went out of style, and no bra. And, you know, and again, like, even hippies and, Anarchists and bohemians these days don't walk around with no bra because it's uncomfortable in the non-existing tie-dye t-shirt. But, you know, there they are. It's like someone's idea, you know, someone who lives in Virginia has like a fantasy of what a hippie looks like, you know, that's 30 years out of date. Um, but anyway, uh, infiltrate citizens groups. Number six, arbitrarily detain and release citizens. Um, now we're all on the list because of surveillance. I mentioned that estimates are that a fifth of any gathering against any of these uh, trends uh, consists of infiltrators. Um, a judge in New York City yesterday confirmed the New York Police Department's right to continue to infiltrate peaceful Muslim groups. Um, the violent Occupy clashes that I mentioned uh, showed many, many confirmations of police infiltrators, often masked men wearing those balaclavas, those black 
masks, pretending to be Occupy members and instigating violence. And you see this pattern around the world. You see it in Greece, you see it in Spain, you see it in Britain, where whenever there's a peaceful citizen uprising, peaceful dissent, there will be these really buff men. You can tell them because no, again, body type, no one, no normal person is that buff. You have to be like a contractor or, you know, on a payroll of Blackwater to be working out all day long like that. And, <laughs> And they're wearing these black ski masks, and they're setting fire to stuff, and they're creating violence and overturning things, and breaking windows, and um, justifying the police crackdown. Uh, I have very, very big reservations about the nature of the violence in Ukraine right now. Oh, yeah. It just is too theatrical, you know. And snipers, like out of nowhere, and these men in in black masks that have been reported in. Uh, uprisings around the world. It's why I always tell protesters in America not to cover their faces. You know, very important not to cover your face. Um, in Bahrain, uh, protests were also broken by violent infiltrators. So that's happening around the world. Um, the sixth step is to target key individuals. And I mentioned that Nazis and all of their imitators, you know, take aim at prominent academics, philosophers, visual artists, opposition leaders. And, you know, they don't have to arrest you. They can go after your job. Um, destroy your reputation and, you know, lead up to that. So 2008 now seems like the good old days because I spoke about, seriously, right? I spoke then about Dan Rather who lost his job after running a critical report on George Bush and the Dixie Chicks, the band, um, who had criticized Bush also and were victims of a kind of backlash where, get this for an echo, uh, groups were organized to burn their CDs uh, right, an echo of the 1933 book burnings in Germany, but of course CDs don't burn. <laughs> so that was like not that well thought out. Um, <laughs> but uh, that, you know, that seems very uh, bucolic times compared to now because the activists I know have been audibly surveilled. Like there's something like we, we started to call the NSA echo where you hear this like distortion and you only hear it when you're talking. You've heard that. Oh my God. Yeah. And equally extremely weird stuff. Like we can get into this in the Q&A, but sometimes I'll make a phone call and I can hear the room of the place that I'm calling, but nobody has answered the phone. You've had that too? Oh, yeah. oh my God. Yeah, and you know, missing, uh, tampering with electronics, missing emails, emails. I had an email that was held up for four months. Is that normal? Does that happen with AOL? Is that normal? Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> right, time to leave AOL, all right. Um, be better examples, better examples. Um, but uh, activists have been, uh, had vicious letters about them sent to their employers, experienced constant hacking of their websites and networks and letters informing them that their identities have been stolen. Um, and so there are fewer and fewer prominent individuals I can even name in the U.S. who still speak out about these abuses. The seventh step is to restrict the press. Are you guys okay? Yeah. All right. In England, uh, in the 18th century, when our country was founded, the king could arrest Thomas Paine, the wonderful writer of the pamphlet Common Sense, which was a foundational document of our revolution. And because of, and you know, they arrested him for you know subversion. And because of this history of leaving countries where people could be arrested and detained and hung for speech, our wonderful founders gave us the precious, I have like, can you have a crush on an amendment? I have a crush on the First Amendment. I get like my heart flutters when I think about the First Amendment. Um, the first five words. The first five words. Government shall make no law. Oh. oh. <laughs> which guarantees our freedom of speech and assembly and our right to petition government for redress of grievances. Now, all dictators try to restrict journalism and free speech, from the Nazis ejecting independent academics from their jobs to the arrest of editors. Mussolini black shirts actually beat up news editors and destroyed presses. Um, and today, critics of Chinese tyranny, like Ai Weiwei, the artist, the visual artist, are detained for weeks and silenced. And What's really scary to me, because I'm in a weird job where people send me these news items, is that I see the same laws being enacted in various countries at the same time. So recently, there have been almost identical laws passed in Britain.
Australia and Canada that assigns a watchdog group to control the press and imposes huge fines on newspapers for perceived transgressions. And in all cases, but especially Britain and Australia, I mean, Britain has a 400-year history of freedom of the press. And this, is a, this hasn't happened since, like, Cromwell's era, you know, this restriction of the press. Um, it's a huge abdication of the tradition of a free press. Well, they took their guns away. Yeah. Circled after the two legs. Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, to, we'll get to guns in the Q&A. Um, but Obama's Justice Department as you well know, has set a record for invoking state secrets to reject journalistic inquiry, to punish whistleblowers, and to criminalize journalism. These direct and indirect attacks range from the revelation of journalist Glenn Greenwald, who reported the Snowden uh, revelations, a yeah, great hero. But you may remember an unbelievable smear against him shortly after where they resurrected like his taste in adult literature, right? To the detention and I would say kidnapping of his partner who was going through security in Britain and the confiscation of his and, and journalist Laura Poitras's computers. Um, after the Snowden revelations were published in The Guardian, the um, in British intelligence services working with the US intelligence services showed up in The Guardian offices to threaten Resbridger. I mean, not with physical violence, but it was, it was a threat. And they destroyed the hard drive of his computer. And he kept trying to explain to them, you can destroy the hard drive, but the files are elsewhere. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, they destroyed the hard drive physically. And he wears the, the ruined hard drive in his jacket pocket and, and holds it out and shows it. Very brave man. I was present at a panel uh, with Russ Bridger, the editor of The Guardian, which published the Snowden revelations and 400 journalists. And it was a debate on the publication of Snowden's material between Russ Bridger and Clapper, who I mentioned was representing the NSA. Clapper said that if The Guardian had, quote, conspired to obtain classified material, that was a criminal offense and they would face criminal charges, which it is not. But I. I mean, it was just an extraordinary moment. I, I wish I could do justice to it, where the editor of a newspaper was being threatened to his face with criminal action. And he kept saying, which we did not. And Clapper kept saying, if you conspired, it's a crime. And Russ Bridger kept saying, trying to get him on the record, you must acknowledge right now that we did not. It was this extraordinary standoff, and a great deal was at stake. Not everybody understood what was going on. Res Bridger was desperately trying to get Clapper to be on the record, acknowledging that it wasn't a crime, so that he could protect himself and his colleagues and employees from criminal charges. Um, and finally, Clapper kind of gave up with that, but then went on to threaten every journalist in the room and said, basically, if you uh, participate in disclosing classified material, you know, that is a crime, which it, it isn't. It is First Amendment protected. The person who leaks classified material is breaking the law, and they know that, and they, you know, take that on board just like um, uh, Watergate, Pentagon Papers. Thank you, Daniel Ellsberg, whom I adore, great hero. You know, he knew, Bradley Manning knew, Edward Snowden knew, that's one thing. But the editor or publisher who publishes it is engaging in freedom of speech, freedom of the press. And uh, I remember the gasp that went up from these 400 journalists, and I shouted, you're threatening him. And other people were, you know, trembling, you know, and reacting to, and shouting, and, and reacting to this threat. But it was a threat, it was a clear threat. Um, all the reporters there knew that they were being threatened. Jane Mayer has written about how investigative journalism of national security issues has unsurprisingly dried up because of threats like these. Um, and recently, uh, congressmen are accusing The Guardian and Greenwald of the crime of theft and selling stolen goods in publishing the material. So they're circling and circling, trying to find a crime, trying to find a crime, a way to criminalize journalism. Um, James Risen of The New York Times has been subpoenaed to reveal a source. Um, so journalism has been criminalized. Number eight, and I'll move quickly so we can take questions, is to recast criticism as espionage and dissent as treason. The heroic Thomas Drake has been 
prosecuted under the Espionage Act, is that correct, for espionage, for being a whistleblower. Uh, Snowden is being threatened with the Espionage Act, and Julian Assange um, has been threatened with the Espionage Act. Uh, but they're, they're saying they're going to drag him here. That's why they're trying to extradite him, so that they can get him under the Espionage Act. Um, the Espionage Act, for those of you who don't know about it, is a very, very evil law, which was invented in World War I because there were critics of the war. And it was used to beat up, imprison, incarcerate, subjugate critics of, of militarism. Um, and it's been used more often in the last few years than it ever has since 1917. And you can be executed under the Espionage Act. So it's a very, very serious thing um, to level at critics of the state. Um, Stalin, for instance, and others had show trials in which critics and dissidents were recast as spies and traitors. Spies and traitors, that's the, that's the uh, meme. Um, I'm going to skip over Julian Assange. You, you know about him. Um, but like most reporters, I mean, why are you not getting a bunch of important news stories? Like most reporters, I just don't reply any longer to sources who offer me classified information, which used to be, like, people who are not reporters have been given hype about what is classified material. First of all, the government is classifying everything, right? But second of all, up and down New York and Washington, reporters used to trade classified material at dinner parties like cocktails. You know, it was the coin of the realm. It was how you got a news story. It was how the democracy functioned. People would leak and, and reporters would report it. And that's how you had a free press and, and how the citizens knew what was going on. Now, I get emails from people saying, I know what happened to that million dollars missing in Iraq or 10 million or whatever it is. And I just won't answer. I won't do the investigative reporting that is my job. And the reason is, is exactly this, because it's become radioactive to even report classified information. Um, SOPA and PIPA are two of the new laws that are aimed at giving governments or its allies in the telecoms control over the internet. Why is this? Because citizens now have the power to act as journalists. And so it's very important to restrict citizens' ability to inform each other of what the government is doing. Are you guys OK? There are only two more steps left, and then happiness. All right, all right, thank you. So the, the next two steps are basically about subverting the rule of law and establishing martial law. So that used to be a very dramatic thing. You had Mussolini kind of rolling into Rome. And uh, as, as often happens, Parliament in Italy just kept legislating because they didn't believe that a coup had taken place. Often there's a delayed reaction to a coup taking place. Um, and and you know, at, at a certain point, Hitler legally legislated that he subverted any law that did not originate with him. So everything was done legally. Stage 10 is the suspension of the Constitution, the establishment of the martial law. So I think, you know, in, in 2008, I kept alerting people to the fact that I didn't think when and if that happened, it would look like that. You know, it, it wouldn't be that dramatic goose stepping into the central square and taking over of, you know, the national radio station. It, it doesn't have to anymore. Um, it would be much more sophisticated. What I predicted in, at the end of the end of America is that if we got to stage 10, it would look like America. We'd still have soap operas and shopping malls and you know, the 4th of July. What we wouldn't have would be freedom. And that it was really important for people to understand that because they have this idea that a police state looks like people being herded into cattle cars. It doesn't look like that. If you look at police states, all over Latin America, throughout history, they have pop stars, they have <coughs> journalism, they have judiciaries, they have elections, right? These, these entities just don't have any real power. Well, the pop stars do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, people have fun in police states. They go roller skating, they go snowboarding, whatever. They just are not allowed to put their hands on the press, uh, the electoral system to, to, to have any real say in what happens. And if they do, these terrible things happen to them in the margins. And the margins get bigger and bigger, and the space people have gets smaller and smaller. So that's, that's where we are now, but it hasn't happened with 
um, you know, in 2008, people were worried, and I was worried, that there would be a declaration of, uh, of a state of emergency and that the, poli the uh, military would be deployed throughout the country. I, that didn't happen, obviously, <clears throat> but that's because it didn't need to. Um, I now believe that our oligarchs in the United States, and I can tell you in the Q&A who they are, have realized that these dramatic gestures are counterproductive and now unnecessary. I hate to say this. The Constitution has been suspended in effect. And our system of checks and balances is no longer disp dispositive. The president, the executive, and the judiciary no longer run the country. The coup has taken place. It is just very legal, very behind the scenes, and very quiet. TIPP is a good example, a multinational agreement that transcends any nation state and its Congress or Parliament. This is the new model of what we're going to see in the future. Um, we're going to see more and more, this happens like with the Olympics. The Olympics will move into a country and make a deal with that nation state to suspend or change the laws to accommodate the Olympics. And we're going to see, like that's the, that's the new normal, right? Basically what I want you to understand is that the, the entities which are massive corporate entities in alliance with kind of oligarchs who nominally hold positions in government are a global force now. They're quite well organized. They've figured out the program and that Western democracies are an annoyance and a hindrance to them, okay? Because Western democracies have parliaments and congresses that pass laws that restrain their actions. So in the future, these entities would like the whole world to look like China. China is a fantastic basis for corporate expansion because there's all kinds of labor, there's all kinds of resources, and no one has any rights. Okay, So that's why you're seeing these same kinds of laws in Australia, in Great Britain, in Canada, in the United States, you know, all over the world. Western, you've got to stop thinking that the nation states and the people who run nation states are the most important people in the world. They're not anymore. They're very subordinated to these entities over their heads. And so what's happening is these entities are simply legislating or making deals around them, right? Like the deal that got illuminated almost indirectly in this biography of Hillary Clinton where the telecoms work informally, unaccountably with government. Because why have the people involved? They just complicate things. So um, that's where we are. Um, I used to think that what was driving this suppression of civil liberties was one sector, which was the military industrial complex, and that they wanted to hype the terror threat to uh, you know, just grow global war and you know, grow their profits forever. But I now think that that's a very small part of the puzzle, and that basically these gigantic multinationals, which are global, have, have figured out um, the atmosphere, the environment globally, that is most beneficial to unfettered profit and suctioning of resources from ordinary people and into their pockets and bottom line. And that, um, you know, this is why it doesn't really matter who's president in the United States right now, um, because there are like six of these entities in the US, big pharma, big insurance, big oil, big war, um, who, who just switch back and forth their candidates. And so they're really trying to distract us by saying, oh, it's a big fight between Republicans and Democrats, or it's a big difference between libertarians and environmentalists. That's not, that's a distraction, that's a show. And this is what's really happening. And so don't get mad at any one American president because the American president just doesn't have that much power anymore. These, it's, it's really almost a figurehead. These entities are there and they're in charge. So now that I've completely made you sad, <laughs> I want to I want to bring you to the next stage of consciousness if I can and collective action. This is very tough shit to fight. 
right? It's very sophisticated. It is way beyond, it's six levels beyond what I thought we were up against, okay? And they have an extraordinary infrastructure in place. I, I, I'd like you to notice that when there were news stories about surveillance in the United States, there were also news stories about surveillance in Germany, surveillance in France, surveillance in Australia, surveillance in New Zealand. This was the new normal. So, you know, Edward Snowden may be our guy, but the telecoms are global. And entities like, you know, these, these transnational entities like the EU, right, are global. Are, are, are a, a small group of actors now able to operate above nation states with no regard for nation states, right? I know you guys hate the state, but at this point we actually kind of need the state to fight, not, we should be the state. We need to be the state to fight against no, these no people. Needs to be the state. Okay, we, we need some organization to fight these entities at this level. And at this level, the law is like our last defense till we figure out another way of operating. The, the law and strengthening the law. And what I mean by that is strengthening. So, so now that you know what's really going on, okay, let's take a deep breath. It's super fucking huge. It's extremely terrifying. It's not the Illuminati, you know? It's not a cabal of whatever. It's just business in a way that makes it more scary and less scary, right? But it's just business who, who would profit from stripping every single one of us of our rights, okay? So, so I'll, wrap up, I'll wrap up by saying that given that this is the new picture, that this is the new war, What's hopeful about this? Okay, we have to really evolve very quickly as human beings to see what's hopeful and to, to work effectively now. Because what it's gonna take to fight this is for us to forget once and for all Sunni, Shia, Republican, Democrat, you know, feminist, anti-feminist, North, South, you know, Christian, Jew. We, we've gotta evolve past that like yesterday. Right? And recognize. Yeah. Recognize that we are a human family with a big fight on our hands, but the fight is not where they want us to direct our attention. The fight is not our neighbor who doesn't share our religion or our point of view. The fight is, you know, most people on the planet want to live decent, peaceful lives. That's what they want. And with the internet, they're able to encounter each other in new ways and learn this. They can't be manipulated as easily by people who want them at each other's throats, right? And, and, and they're the family, that's us now, right? That's us, that's our us. And that's what we have to build because the fight now is how to organize and create new institutions, new laws, new uh, strategies, new efforts to stop this thing that wants to break us apart so it can subdue us. And there are ways to do it, like this movement can do it. Repealing uh, the Patriot Act could do it. Um, uh, stopping surveillance could do it. Supporting her and the ACLU and the Center for Constitutional Rights and Thomas Drake and Edward Snowden and Julian Assange, you know, could do it. Um, you know, uh, fight this fight to keep the militarization out of your police forces. This is exactly like what you what we're struggling for and groping for with inadequate information, inadequate resources. We have to finish the analysis and make it grow around the nation and around the world because this is what we're up against, right? And when you get it, you know what to do. You know what laws to pass. You know how to organize. You know how to not be distracted, right? And the the creativity, I mean, I, I sometimes feel so overwhelmed, but I also think there have been very dark times in human history before. And when people actually see the pieces, they find resilience. And there's so much intelligence in this room. And you know, all the 1.1 million people downloaded the first End of America talk that I gave. So this is the second one. So if just 1.1 million people do it again, that's one in 300 people in the United States. And those people can talk to their friends and talk to their friends and put together the solutions for the future. You know, fearless and new, whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's new encryption or whether it's, you know, new 
uh, awareness of how to look at guns maybe or how to look at terrorism or how to look at those bad Muslims who are really our brothers and sisters, you know, or how to look at our neighbor across the way that we think we have nothing in common with, who's our ally and our best friend, or the person around the globe who we think is our enemy, who's really our, 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 our heart's comrade in this fight for freedom. So this is a fight before us. God bless you. I know that with your ingenuity and your creativity and your courage and your faith, I know that we will win. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there a, so people have questions. Yeah, can I go down and speak to people? Yes. You want to mic them, sure. Okay, I think he's got one. Hey, uh, on your number 10, where you're saying how well, you know, the whole, you know, martial law, uh, what do you think of what happened in Boston? When we were looking oh, for bombing? a pressure cooker and two teenagers, you know, and then they took over the whole city and shut it down. And to me, that looked a whole lot like martial law. Yeah. Um, oh, God, I can't believe. See, this is why I didn't want to give this talk, because I knew that we have this conversation. And now it's on the record. All right, let me take a step back. And No, no, you ha we have to deal with it. Let me take a step back and a deep breath, because this is a very painful thing to talk about. Um, so all over the world, we know, it's well established, uh, the State Department and intelligence agencies engage in theater, and it's what they do, it's spycraft, to create um, spectacles and events that people may not realize are spectacles and events, but that, well, like the, um, the overthrow of Mossadegh in the 50s in Iran. Uh, it, they, they'll funnel money to protesters, they'll, you know, fly people in to infiltrate protesters, they'll create fake newspapers, and so on. So we know that this happens in countries around the world. I believe that a law has been passed in the United States. I think it's part of the Defense Authorization Act. I need to confirm this. That, pardon me, now makes it legal to propagandize American citizens. Is that, do we know about that? Yeah, it's true. And is it in the NDAA or is it in something else? Do we know? It's a separate bill. It's a separate bill. And it's been passed. It's now law? Do we know what the, two years ago. Two years ago. Do we know what the name of it is? Oh, thank you. Will you send me the link? Yeah. Thank you. So what this means is, and I, you know, as a journalist to say these words, just I can't tell you with what a heavy heart I say them, but we've entered an era in which it is not crazy to assess news events to see if they're real or not real. And in the United States as well as overseas. And in fact, it's kind of crazy not to. Now, you know, there's so much uh, hype about what I just said, and, and so I want to be very clear about it so it can't be taken out of context. <clears throat> you know, there's, <clears throat> pardon me, this kind of reflexive vilification of anyone speculating about that because they become a conspiracy theorist, right? Well, just bear with me. You know, I've often thought about this because our intelligence agencies, and for, I respect spies, I mean, you know, who are doing, like before it got out of control, I believe we need intelligence, I believe we need intelligence agencies. I don't think there's anything dishonorable about being in the intelligence services if you obey the Constitution and the law. Um, but all over the world, our intelligence services are engaged in conspiring to create outcomes. That's their job, that's how they're successful. So <clears throat> now that it's illegal to propagandize in the United States, uh, it doesn't surprise me that there's more and more um, products coming up in popular culture, more and more events in the news stream that seem to be, to my eye, to be subsidized. 
uh, let me give you some examples of that. I'm not talking about Boston right now. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. We also talked earlier about infiltrators, right, and how they provoke violence. This is well established. So if we know that infiltrators by the police, NYPD, they've been documented, or other police forces, dress up like people they're not and provoke violence, why is it unthinkable that there might be spectacles that might drive an outcome in the news stream? Let me give you a couple of quick examples. And all I'm saying is we unfortunately, and I have to say this to my fellow journalists, journalists as well, we've entered a time in which we need to be very skeptical about the news stream and look at it critically and ask for more verification and more inquiry. And that's just being good reporters. And it makes it like this, there's spectacle fed into the news media in China. There's spectacle fed into, like Chile. How did Pinochet, you know, engage in his coup? He created uh, photographs of a cache of weapons that the terrorists had, you know, hidden. Was it real? Was it not? Most historians think it wasn't. I mean, this is like not unusual, you know, in the process of creating a closed society. So if laws have made it legal to assassinate American citizens and legal to propagandize them, why should it be crazy or weird to think that that might be for a reason, right? All right, I saw the movie uh, Zero Dark Thirty, thank you very much. And I have worked on two presidential campaigns, so I recognize political talking points. And I wrote a piece saying, this reads like the Pentagon signed off on the script. Because there were like chunks of political talking points identifiable to anyone who's worked in Washington. Right? And you don't come up with those if you're a writer writing a screenplay. Um, and everyone was very upset. It was very controversial and scandalous. But in fact, belatedly, a news story came out saying that in fact the Pentagon had, I think, subsidized some of it, but had certainly consulted directly on the script. And I see more and more TV shows about the CIA and more and more TV shows about spies and gigantic blockbusters in which surveillance is normalized and gigantic blockbusters in which people are tortured to get them to talk in a way that might exonerate people who actually tortured people to get them to talk in Guantanamo. And there's all this money being pumped into these unaccountable, you know, terrorism fighting things. And now there's no law preventing that money from going through front organizations right into popular culture. So that's of interest to me. And so another thing I want to say, and there's so many people waiting to ask a question, but I just need to say this, is I'm skeptical of certain news events that seem more theatrical than the norm. Or I want to ask questions about them. Because I was in CNN once recently, and they were reporting a story about a water skier who had been decapitated on a lake between Mexico and the United States, and it had something to do with ter you know, a terrorism threat, right? And I was like, decapitated water skier. Sometimes you hear these things and it's like so <laughs> novelistic. You're like, real life doesn't work that way. Like these are so novelistic. Someone's coming up with it to make it stick in the popular imagination. Or it just makes you think, well, I'd like to document that. I'm a reporter, what's the source? And I. And it kept being just this one guy, Judge Arpajo in Texas. I may be mispronouncing his name. He's a very, cons Ar yes, Ar yeah. He was the source, he was the source, he was the source. And I have this wonderful Facebook community all over the world. And I went on Facebook and I'm like, Mexican Facebook community, is there any reporting about a beheaded water skier in this lake, in this place in Mexico? And they're like, no, there's, what are you talking about? No, there's nothing like that, there's, doesn't exist. So I turned to the CNN producer and said, do you have a second source for this story? And it was all over the news, all over the news, all over the news. And they're like, uh, and they checked and it's like, nope, just this guy, judge, whatever. And I'm like, well, can you find a second source? And they were blushing and embarrassed and they looked and they confessed that they didn't have a second source, which if you know what journalism is, you're <laughs> supposed to doc, you know, confirm it with two sources. So ever since that experience, CNN is running with this, no one's verifying it. Journalists aren't in a position to follow up on anything anymore because budgets are slashed and there's no investigative reporting. Um, all this nonsense can enter the media stream for purposes that have to do with advancing agendas because no one's checking. That's all I want to say about that. Um, 
can I take more questions? I, so Boston, I, I guess my feeling about any of these things is let's investigate. We need to investigate. We need to ask better questions. We need to interview the doctors at the hospital. We need to interview the victims. We need to, you know, get all the footage ourselves. We need to train journalists, citizens to be journalists and to have websites. And I'm, I'm busy building one as a startup where citizen journalists can document events so that we're not leaving it to the gatekeepers. Yeah. Does that answer your question? That wasn't your question. I'm so sorry. All right. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. A suggestion and a wish for you. Thank you. Uh, we're all growing and evolving, and I've seen you over the years as you've been evolve evolving. Um, I hope that sometime soon you'll regret having said that you wish for laws. We <laughs> We have, we have hundreds of thousands of laws now. We need laws repealed. Okay. I hope that I someday you. you will change that. Look, I'm here to learn, and, and every time I talk to a libertarian community or liberty community, I learn really, really new important things. So if you want to tell me after this over a beer, or everybody does, why that is, I'm going to listen. <laughs> I guess how I feel about how I feel about law right now, and this is an interesting argument or discussion we should have if we had time, is that right now the only thing keeping us from mayhem is is like six lawyers who care about the Constitution, trying to use the law to keep them from seizing us in our homes. And so what I want is for us to make the laws, us to decide the laws, for us to be the government, for us to be the state. All right, so we'll have that we'll have that discussion over like six beers. We'll, we'll All right, thank you. Go ahead. Naomi, thanks for a great speech. I want to welcome you to the uh, moral high ground since you've left <laughs> since you have left the progressive status gulags. <laughs> You're saying that you want us to evolve in our humanity and that we need to envision a world that's better than the one we have now. I'd like to offer you a humble prescription on how to do that. Please. Rob yourself of this constitutional madness you are possessing. I don't understand. The Constitution, Naomi, is one of the most cunning, clever, and sly propaganda instruments to enslave a people and make them appear to be free <laughs> and think and perceive they are free because it is not. I offer you two thought experiments. Number one, in your conversation this evening, you alluded to this. That is, do you notice that the word unconstitutional has no descriptive value whatsoever now or in 1791? The second thought experiment is this. Every time we try to defend ourselves from a monstrous Leviathan government, we go to the Bill of Rights that the Federalists kicked and screamed about and reduced from 200 to 12 to 10, and that's what we're left with. And if Washington and Hamilton had their way, the Bill of Rights would have never existed, and we would have no way to protect ourselves from the Constitution. Because the Bill of Rights are the brakes to the Leviathan vehicle that is the Constitution. Thank you. I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Th uh, th thank you also, Naomi, for coming to speak. Got my head spinning with all of this. Um, I, you sound like a very well thought out, very intelligent lady. Thank you. And I would like your thoughts on an upcoming event. Um, there is a scheduled mass demonstration in Washington, D.C. on May 16th called American Spring. Ah. Uh, personally, I, I plan to attend. Um, well, <laughs> I would. But let's, let's excuse hear me, what I have the floor. Yeah. I would like your thoughts on it, up, down, left, or right. Uh, I don't know enough about it, but I, oh boy, um, I guess I feel like our house is burning down and we can have and should have all these discussions about this Constitution, this Bill of Rights, progressive, libertarian, uh, sort of secondary to our stopping the house from burning down. And so if it takes going to Washington, like I keep thinking about Germany in 1934 and 1935, and it's like, first you stop the Nazis, first you restore you know, civil society, then you figure out who the administration is, you know, or, how the, or, or even how you want to organize society. And so I think we should have all these discussions and not stop them about an ideal society, but urgently go to Washington, for 
God's sake, go to Washington and do what you can there because Washington is trying to kill us. So we need to engage with Washington while they're trying to kill us. Naomi, uh, you talked a little bit about despair. And I just want to say that your talk actually filled me with hope. And I want to, I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming here and sharing this perspective. Um, many of us have been seeing this for a long time, and many of us been, have just been wondering why reporters don't see it. And I guess I, um, my question to you is um, what appears to us to be either stupidity or complicity. Uh, what, what do you see when you talk to your fellow reporters? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, first, before, <laughs> before, before we move on to that, can I just ask you, because I'm going to leave here and I'm going to be kind of exhausted and depressed and not have all of your beautiful energy to sustain me. So tell me why it fills you with hope so I can hold on to that when I'm not with all of you. Because you actually see what we've been looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Crazy. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's awfully all lonely. Us, it's yeah, awfully lonely yeah. sitting and, and just going, why is, wh what is going on with this TV set? Right. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. I, okay. I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Um, oh, my God. All right. So it's not that reporters are, you know, faithless or stupid. A lot of things are going on. If you pitch a story about, all right, who do I get to write about Snowden or civil liberties? For. I, I know I'm one of, I get published whenever I want, but if I want to write this story about Jessica being detained for representing Edward Snowden, I know there's no point in my pitching it to the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post because they won't run it. They just won't run it. And that the only chance I have to get it published is to go to Britain or to write it for The Guardian or to do it for The Huffington Post, maybe. And how do editors make those decisions? It's no one's giving you know, orders to them saying don't cover Snowden. It's a kind of collective consciousness, I think, where you just know some things as an editor are radioactive. And right now, um, reporters are scared and editors are scared and they look at what happened to Alan Rusbridger and they are not that brave and they don't have an, it's economics too. Rusbridger has a trust that funds the Guardian, so he's free to do this. But, you know, uh, the Washington Post is now owned by some giant conglomerate. And you know, the Wall Street Journal is owned by Murdoch. And there are no independent newspapers anymore. So who's going to publish it? You know, the, the, basically, the general electric, the, the people who want Snowden to shut up are the same people who own the news media now. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Right, well, thank you so much for what you're doing. And please keep talking. Thank you. Well, I need your I need your help. I need your help. Uh, so you you keep talking too. All right. Thank you. Uh, before I get to the question, uh, you said there are no more independent newspapers. Uh, that's not actually accurate. I actually publish a newspaper right. that is the only newspaper that I am aware of anywhere in the world that is not copyrighted. It's distributed oh, wow. all throughout New Hampshire. Fantastic. It's put online for free so that anybody can download the PDF, wow. go to a printer and get copies printed. What's the name of it? It's FPP News awesome. online at FPP.cc. Uh, second, before I get to the question, I'm still waiting on the beer from six years ago, right. so well, I'm buying it for you as Thank soon you. as we're done here. It's a collective beer. All right. <laughs> and now for the question, it's the same question that I asked Thomas Drake earlier today uh, when he gave a wonderful speech with Jessalyn Raddick. Knowing that there are more laws in existence than, that can be read in what I've heard to be four lifetimes, would you say that the only real crime is disobeying the state? The only real cr wait, I don't understand the question. Did I get your name wrong this whole time? I'm so sorry, God. Everybody, it's Jessalyn Raddick. She was courteous <laughs> enough not to correct me. It's not Jessica. I beg your pardon, Jessalyn Raddick. I'm so, sorry. for ahead. example, disobeying the state, uh, there's ordinances and regulations and statutes that say that there are certain types of plants that you cannot possess, 
So if you possess the plant, you have harmed no right. one. You're going to jail for disobeying the state. Right. If you are Edward Snowden and you give documents to the Guardian, or if you're Private Manning and you give documents and video to WikiLeaks, the only crime that you have committed oh, is disobeying, disobeying the, state. the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think people still go to jail for murdering people, um, but I do think that disobeying the state is turning into the main preoccupation of our central government and power structure. True. Pe people do go to jail for murder and theft, but people are punished more harshly for disobeying the state. I mean, uh, I, I can't statistically agree with that, but I, I understand your rhetorical point and I, I agree with it. I think that, look, I'm a cultural critic, so I like to look at what the culture is freaking out about. And certainly it is much more scary and chilling and intimidating to contemplate disobeying the state now than it used to be 10 years ago. And that has bigger repercussions for everyone, I would say, than whatever the penalties are for murder or theft. Yeah. Well, this is kind of going across the lines that have been gone before, but I guess um, you talk about the Constitution and there being a coup uh, against the government, but I, and again, this is going across lines we've already had, but what about the idea that the actual coup is the, the very existence of a state, and I would define the state as a monopoly on the initiation of force. What about the idea that the very, that the very existence of a state and that the Constitution is a coup against liberty itself, and I would encourage you to look in the anarcho-capitalism and if you have any thoughts on that. Sure, I mean, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the land, I'm in the land of, of anarcho-capitalists, I guess. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> excuse me, um, can I say something? I need to say something very heartfelt to all of you about, I think, a difference we may still have. And again, the night is young, and, and as I say, I'm here to learn. Um, but it's important. It's, I want to caution you about something. Every community tends to create an us versus them mentality and to create binary, a binary worldview. And it's, it's very seductive because you, can, you, you think, well, here's, I've solved the problem. And if we all just believe X and see the world as this one thing is super bad and we'll do the opposite of it, you have love and you have clarity and you get support for your ego and <clears throat> it's very, very seductive. I, I, you guys are very precious and important and I want to caution you against falling into that trap because um, a lot of reasons. It's, it's not, I think... I think the place we're in is too complicated for that, A. B, um, you, uh, over and over again, I've seen movements demonize a thing. And in this case, I'm hearing that the demonized thing is the state. And they think that that solved the crisis. But it never solves the crisis to demonize a thing, ever. Right? It just doesn't. And I guess, apart from that, because I don't know what the answer is in your world, because I'm not sophisticated enough in your world to know what challenge I, I would give to this, I guess I do want to say that again and again and again, democracy, a republic, representative government, which I guess you would say is a state, has saved people from tyranny, from oppression, from cruelty from injustice and you can say you found a better way and I'm waiting to hear about it but I haven't seen a better system of organization than a working representative democracy a working one and I also want to and I say this to Marxists it's funny you guys are kind of mirror images of Marxists in some ways I mean bear, bear with me bear with me uh, and feminists too like any 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 ideology that has a core of real insight can, can develop a kind of true believer mentality. And I'm always saying to Marxists, show me a real program. If you're in charge, like tomorrow, and you're making decisions, and you're really empowered, what would a real Marxist program look like? Well, yeah. All right, so that sounds great. Well, but wait a minute. They say the same thing about what if no one owned the means of production, or everyone? No, 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 we're going to own property. OK, so all I'm saying is show me, like, I'm waiting, and the night is young. 
but I need you to th I need you to not think like utopians, right? I need you to think like you're really going to change the world, okay? And, and wait, wait, I really, I need to say this. If you're really going to change the world, you can't just be against stuff. You need to have a real program as if you are suddenly deciding what happens in New Hampshire. All right, that's great. I mean, that's why I love you. That's why I love you. But, but when you say the state sucks, the state sucks, if you're running for office in New Hampshire, which I, which I want you to do, wait, but listen to me. I'm here to speak to you from my heart because you are the last best hope, okay? You guys need to run for office in New Hampshire. And you... Okay. I'm 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 for it, but I guess at some point there there's going to be a group of people in no state, right? But then what happens? And if you show me how you're going to organize society, then I'm signed on. If it's peaceful and just, all right, all right. When I say that, I don't think we'll dem Okay, we hate force, I hate force, force sucks, uh, but, but what if democracy, like real democracy is I think what you call anarchy or libertarianism, because if the state is, uh, all right, all right, if the state is us, if it's us really making the decisions, isn't it just a word to call it the state? Maybe it's just citizens making decisions. Oh, you guys want the market to make decisions? All right. All right, let's take another question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I need it. I'm going to need it. Absolutely. And then you can educate me. Go ahead. Thank you for coming. Thank you speaking. for having me. Thank you for opening your eyes. Continue to. Um, and there's a lot of good ribbing going on here about anarchy and, and so forth. It took these people, it took me a long time to get to that point. Okay. A lot, we're born into this system that we have and it takes a while to wake up. So don't feel bad. We all rib each other. You know, it's ribald. I, I'm, I'm there. Okay. Um, there's a couple things, there's a couple things that I would add to your list. Okay. Uh, one of them would be the worship of the authority figures. Okay, yeah, of, yeah, that's the, a good point. The military yeah. and the police, yeah. because it suppresses any sort of uh, meaningful criticism or, or uh, commentary. Right. You immediately get labeled as, not a traitor, but um, just being, being uh, unpatriotic yeah. uh, and uncommitted to your community. The other thing that I would say is all of those governments gained control and manipulated their currency. Oh, interesting, interesting. So wow. in all of these instances, you'll see them control money and manipulate wow. it. Okay. And with the Fed, what you see is the interest rate manipulation mm -hmm. and the printing. Wow, yeah. OK, I'll bear that in mind. Thank you for educating me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Naomi. Hi. I would just like to ask in follow-up to your End of America that you take the same brilliance that you applied in reviewing historically what's been done to shut down democracy and apply that to looking at what has successfully allowed for revolution and for things like the civil rights movement. What were the components there when people came together and told their governments that they weren't going to have certain injustices and put up with it any longer. It's a beautiful question. For you to Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. And, and I'm glad you asked it because it's very uplifting and it's a wonderful thing to start thinking about as we start to think about dispersing for the evening. And uh, I actually was asked that often enough that I wrote a book called Give Me Liberty, which is a sequel which has 55 action steps you can take taken from my studying successful revolutions. And that's why I'm so worried about, yeah, thank you. Here it is. <laughs> it sounds like we all need to read Give Me Liberty then. Um, well, <laughs> you, you're welcome to. Uh, but, and you can take it out of the library if you don't want to buy it. For those of you who <laughs> do not want to participate in the market, or maybe those who do want to, buy it at my, you know, buy it at the most expensive price point if that's uh, liberating for you. And um, Do you accept Bitcoin? I'll take Bitcoin. I'll take whatever. But... <laughs> 
But um, I do want to say that uh, the biggest thing you can do is freedom of assembly. Um, that is, if, you know, for you guys just to get into the streets and make it safe in New Hampshire to protest. That you know, what I learned from the successful revolutions is that when people get into the streets uh, without being murdered, that that is unstoppable. So that's why I love you all so, so much. You're here in a thank group, you so and, much. and you're willing to perhaps take this party into the streets. I have the honor of the last yeah. comment yes. from New York Jewess to New York Jewess. I invite you to my property in New Hampshire and I will teach you how to shoot. Right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> perfect. So, that is a perfect note to end on. <laughs> that, I, I, I feel so liberated. I've got Bitcoin, a new currency, a yeah. couple of guns, some new friends, some beers. What else does a girl want in addition to liberty? Thank you all so much. Thank you, New Hampshire Liberty Forum. Thank you so, so much. Thank you.